Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church. Well, good morning. Welcome back to the Shores Church. Excited to be with you for week two of our series, A Thrill of Hope. Last week, we really dove into the idea of hope deferred, and we kind of landed on the idea that just because hope is deferred doesn't mean it's canceled. It just means it's pushed off to a different time. And the thing that we need to realize about God is God's timing is better than our timing. So even when things don't happen the way we would want them to, or we would expect them to, we can hold on to the idea that God is in control. He's deferring it to the right moment so that the ultimate impact for the kingdom can occur. We really kind of landed on that word tikva, if you remember as well. And it's a Hebrew word that is for hope. And it is the idea of, of a cord that we're connected to this idea. And it's a full expectation that we believe this is going to happen. That when we have hope, then we can know that God's going to come through and God's going to do what he said he was going to do. That we can have full expectation that God is going to show up, that we can hold on to this idea because we know that it's not going to go anywhere on us. So that hope may be deferred, but we know that that hope is still going to come through because our hope is in God. So even when our plans get pushed off, our plans get changed, our hope is not in anything of this world. Our hope, our living hope is Jesus Christ. The blessed hope that we're going to be spending eternity in heaven with God forever, that we have a hope that's worth holding on to. Before we dive into today's message, which is hope heard, we're going to uh, just repeat after me, and then I'm going to read that passage of scripture. Your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. I will seek you with all of my strength. I choose to live my life according to your word. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal. Well, this morning as we study this idea of hope heard, we're going to jump right into basically where we left off last week of 1 Samuel chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 20. So would you join me this morning as we read? Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of, the, of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. And the Lord called again, Samuel. And Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. And the Lord called Samuel again the third time, and he rose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. 
So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. And I declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord, and Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. And Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. The first point that I really want us to pull out of this today is something we saw right away in the passage, and it was the word of the Lord was rare. The word of the Lord was rare during this time period, which when we look at the beginning of the the Bible all the way until now, that seems a little bit crazy to believe that we have so many moments of God speaking, so many moments of God moving, so many moments of God doing such unique, amazing things. And even if we really look at just from the time of Moses, until now, which really isn't a sizable amount of time, that we we see God descend upon a mountain, that God's speaking directly to the Israelites, uh, directly to Moses, leading them through the, the, the Red Sea, that we, we see all of these moments, but we reach a spot just a few generations down the, the road from Moses where the word of the Lord was rare, that the, the, the people just weren't listening and Here's one of the things we need to realize is this is kind of what happened in this time period is that Moses, uh, that he's leading the people. It's his time to, to go to heaven and he gets to see the promised land, but Joshua is the one who's going to lead them in. So Moses turns over the leadership of the nation to, to Joshua. Joshua then goes in and they begin taking over the land and taking possession of what God has called them to. And then when Joshua's time is done, we see this sequence of judges that would come in. And that Joshua puts out a challenge as, for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. But it's up to the Israelites of, are they going to serve the Lord? So when we see these judges come in, for a moment, you you hear judge and you think like what we have today. That someone sitting behind a bench and someone giving their proclamation. And some of that happened. They would go to them for wisdom, but... The judge would oftentimes be somebody, when you think of someone like Samson, who was a military type leader, that they would protect the people, that they would give wisdom for the people. And a sequence happens when you look at the, the book of uh, Judges, is that it's almost this, this loop where they, they start here, and the people go down, and then a judge comes up and brings them back up again, leading them back towards God. The judge judges for a while, then it, their time is done, and then the people go down again, and then the next judge comes in, and then the, the people go down again, and then the next judge comes in. If you notice, that pattern is a long-term slope downwards. That as hard as the judges may try, they can bring the people back in the direction of God, but the judges are never truly successful at bringing the people all the way back to the period of time that was Moses and the Israelites at the, the mountain when they hear God's voice speak. That it's a progressive slope down. That they're not doing what they're supposed to do. They're not living for God. And they start to reach a spot where they can't hear God's voice anymore. And even the priest is struggling to hear God's voice. That this this pattern of free fall is not God's intention. But it's what's happening because the people are tuning out God's voice. Now, this obviously doesn't go for everybody in uh, this time period, that there's some people who are definitely 
listening to God or seeking God, and we don't have to look any further than last week's message when we look at Hannah, that we have somebody who is deliberately seeking God, believing God for, for more, that hoping in God, that has tikva, that is expecting God to do something, expecting God to show up. So there are individuals who fit that category, but for the most part, people aren't hearing God's voice. Even the priests aren't hearing God's voice. And we're in a progressive slope downwards, moving away from God. And this is where we find Samuel in this moment, that we, we have this pattern of just saying, well, I'm, I'm not hearing God's voice, so let me just go and do something uh, that I think is right. And it's this very slow moving away from God. And then we start saying, well, God won't speak to me. Is it that God won't speak or is it that we won't listen and that we've moved so far away that we can't hear what God is trying to tell us? That we need to be willing to hear. And if we're willing to hear, just like Hannah, God will speak and God will move. But we have to be willing to move in the direction of God. We need to be willing to listen for the voice of God. And then we need to be willing to do what God has called us to do. Hannah is willing to give her firstborn back to God so that she can experience what God has in store for. We can look even in the, the story of uh, the Christmas story about how Mary is approached by the angel and saying, you're going to have a baby boy. The baby boy, you need to name Jesus. It, Jesus is going to be the, the savior of mankind. Joseph gets that same visitation that we, we have individuals who are presented with something, an opportunity they hear from God, and then they have to choose of, am I going to do what God wants me to do? And so often we want what we want from God and we don't want what God wants from us. We want what we want from God, but we don't want what God wants from us. So if we want to really hear God's voice, we need to do uh, some different things. And the first thing we need to do is we need to learn to recognize God's word. We need to learn to recognize God's word. Here in this particular passage, we, we have a moment where we have Samuel as a boy that he's never been in, introduced to, to God yet. We see that in the text that he doesn't uh, know who God is, that uh, the, the story of God hasn't been revealed to him. But what's amazing to me, and this mirrors the, the church today in so many different places, is that we're doing ministry, but we don't know who we're ministering to or why we're ministering. We're doing it because we feel like I need to do this in order to draw closer to God. I need to do this because it's the right thing to do. I need to earn my salvation. And that's not why we do any of this. If that's why we do it, we miss the point. We miss the heart. That when we, we look at this in uh, verse 1 of chapter 3, it says, The boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli. But then we, we get to verse 7. It says, Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. So he's ministering, but he doesn't know the word of the Lord. Do you see that disconnect there? Do you see that problem? And I think that so often the problem within the church is that we want to do the right things, but in the process of trying to do the right things, we don't catch the heart of God. God is much more interested in our heart and us serving him and following him and seeking after him, that if we follow and seek and put our mindset on the presence of God, everything else will come with it. All of a sudden, we'll have a passion and a desire to do the things of God. All of a sudden, we'll have a desire to serve people because we'll be mirroring Jesus. And when we mirror Jesus, we have an expectation that we want to do what Jesus did. One of the things that I want you to, to realize is that in, in a few weeks, we're going to be signing up for our January anchor groups. Anchor groups aren't just something that I want you to do because I want you to fill up your calendar. But what I want you to do is I want you to be a part because two different things happen. One is you meet people, you sharpen one another. As you sharpen one another, as iron sharpens iron, so does one man sharpen another. Scripture tells us that. And so in anchor groups, we can challenge one another. If all of a sudden I'm not doing things the way I should be doing things, somebody can call me out and they can help me grow. And then I can help others grow. But one of the things we're going to be doing with this next sequence of them is we're going to be partnering with the Bible engagement plan and the Assemblies of God to study the entirety of the Bible. This is something I know that sometimes it's, it's a struggle. It's a big book. There's, it's a commitment. 
But at the same time, if we make a commitment to studying the Bible together as a church, we are going to grow. And if we grow in our knowledge, in our wisdom, in our passion, in our love for God, then what we'll notice is that we'll start growing outward and we're going to start loving on people more. We're going to start seeing people walk into the doors of the church, experience God, and have their life radically transformed because we made a conscious choice of saying, I want more of God. One of the things that I hear so often is, well, I just don't have time, or I don't know how, or I forget to. Let me just throw this out there. Think of your favorite TV show. Do you have to remind yourself to watch that show? Is there a desire in your heart to watch that show? Or maybe it's your favorite team. Is there a, is there a need for you to go out and figure out, well, how am I going to watch that game this week? No, you usually figure out, like, well, I'm going to invest uh, time into watching that show or that game. I'm going to invest money so that I can get that channel so that I can watch that game. Or maybe I'm going to go out with somebody, especially if it's a game, and we're going to go to a place like Buffalo Wild Wings, and we're going to watch that game, and I'm going to buy food, and I'm going to make an investment in this. I'm going to buy the, the clothing. I'm going to buy the tickets to go there. That it's all these different things that we invest our time and our resources into our favorite shows, into our favorite teams, into our favorite activities. But when it comes to the church, it's like, ooh, I don't know if I've got 20 minutes today to read the Bible. God, maybe I'll come back tomorrow. We, we, that needs to not be us because otherwise we're not going to hear God's voice unless we're willing to set that time aside. So let me encourage you and challenge you. And you're going to always hear me say this intentionally set time aside to read God's word, to study God's word, to, to say like, hey, I want to be in an anchor group because I want to be sharpened. I want to look more like God. I'm living for eternity, not next week. That when we make that choice, all of a sudden, everything in our life begins to change. Samuel begins in this passage to recognize God's voice. As uh, Eli tells him, if you hear that voice again, say, speak for I'm listening. And then all of a sudden, Samuel starts understanding God's voice, and it changes things. We get this famous statement of, uh, speak for your servant is listening, that hope is heard in this context, because Samuel begins to realize, okay, that's God speaking to me. I need to listen. When God speaks to us, we need to listen. And you may not hear an audible voice of God, but let me tell you something. This is God's word right here. God is speaking to you. God has something in store for you. And all you have to do is spend time in this word and you're going to begin to hear God's voice in a way you never had before. The next thing I want us to, to recognize today is that we need to learn to recognize uh, and respond to God's word. We need to learn to respond when we hear God's word. Step one is going to require you to recognize God's voice and listen. But step two now is that ability of taking the next step and responding. Just because you recognize God's voice isn't enough. That you need to be intentional of saying, I recognize that God's speaking to me, and now I will respond and do what God has called me to do. Recognize he spoke, respond accordingly. Imagine if I told you right now that you were going to win $25 million. $25 million. That would be a fantastic moment in your life. You, you pay your taxes. You're about $12 million left. And now all of a sudden you, you have the money needed that if you're smart financially, you would never have to work again. And you could pull off about a million dollars a year that you'd be able to live off of. Imagine that for a moment that you would be able to live off of about a million dollars a year if you invested that money properly. That would change your life. It would radically change and transform your life. It would allow you to, to live a different way, to live in, uh, with better resources. It would allow you to never have want again. It would allow you to give and bless other people the way you never had before. It would change your life. Now, in order to claim that $25 million, though, you would have to take a flight to El Paso, Texas, and you would have to wait in a hotel room for a week. That doesn't seem so hard. That doesn't seem so crazy. To get $25 million, you take a flight to El Paso, 
you sit in a hotel room for a week. At the end of the week, you're given $25 million. I think most of us would sign up for that, but I think we would find ourselves typically in one of three groupings if we're all honest. In group number one, you get so excited that you don't even listen to the instructions that you wind up, instead of going to El Paso and flying there, you wind up buying old El Paso taco seasoning and throwing a taco party for your family and your friends because you got so excited about this $25 million. You heard El Paso, and then you went and you did the first thing that sounded right, old El Paso taco seasoning. And you throw a massive taco party and you don't get any of the money. I think that's some of us in group one is that we get excited about the potential and then we do nothing. We don't listen, we don't respond accordingly or appropriately, and we go and do something completely different. God has better plans for you than that. And if you find yourself always falling in that, you hear God's word, but then you do nothing about it, today I would challenge you is make the choice of saying, I want to follow and listen to the instructions, listen and then respond. Group number two is you hear and you respond. You, you listen to this hope, you listen, you get excited, you believe that this is going to happen, you get on the plane, you go to uh, El Paso, Texas, you sit in the hotel room, and on day five or day six, when the money is about to be yours, you get bored, your hope uh, runs out, and you just walk out the door. You heard about the hope, but your hope runs out short. And if you would have just waited another day or two, you would have gotten a check for $25 million, but you left the hotel. And because you left the hotel, you get nothing. And then we have group three, where you hear and you respond and you patiently wait on God. You have heard what he said, and then you have responded accordingly. You fully execute what God has called you to do. And in his timing, God raises you up and gives you what he promised. That it kind of has that hope deferred feeling. Sometimes we have to wait. Sometimes it doesn't come when we expect it. Sometimes it comes when we may not even feel like we're ready for it. But when we do what God has called us to do, God will be faithful to do what he says he's going to do. Samuel is greeted with this opportunity. He hears God's voice. He recognizes God's voice. And now he's presented with the difficult journey of telling Eli that Eli's time is done, that, that God's going to bring judgment, that God is going to uh, respond accordingly for the way that Eli has acted and behaved and how he's run his own personal family, and that Eli's time is up. And it would be a very difficult thing. Imagine telling somebody that you care about, somebody you would view as a mentor, that, yeah, God's done with you, that it, it's time for something different. And so he's greeted with that opportunity, but he doesn't really want to. And Eli encourages him and says, look, you got to tell me. I know God spoke to you. You got to tell me what he said. And so Samuel is faithful. He does what he's supposed to do. And then in verse 19, we see that Samuel grows. The Lord was with him and none of his words fell to the ground. When we hear that, what we understand to be happening is that Samuel was growing in the ways of being a prophet. This is the beginning of him moving into a prophetic ministry. This is the beginning of him moving into being the final judge of, of Israel. This is the beginning of him moving into being the one to anoint Saul as king and then David as king. That this is the beginning of him setting up that lineage that will lead us to Jesus, that we celebrate with the birth of Jesus, that it's this moment of hope was deferred with Hannah, hope was heard with Samuel, and because Samuel heard that hope and that he responded to that hope, that next week we're going to be talking about how hope can abound, how there can be plenty of hope, how we can move in hope because we know that God is faithful to do what he said he's going to do. This morning as we move into the end of service, Here's what I want to challenge you with. Here's what I want to encourage you with is that for every one of us, there's moments in our life where we, we fall into what we did last week where hope is deferred and it feels like it's being pushed off. Or maybe we, we don't even feel like our hope is, is heard from God or we don't feel like we can hear God. And that what we, we need to realize is that when we are staying in God's word, 
and we are hearing God's voice, our hope is heard. That we have a living hope that in the Old Testament, they weren't sure what was coming. But then when we make it to the New Testament, what we can realize when we hit to the Gospels is that hope is heard that God sends Jesus, that Jesus is going to uh, die on the cross, that Jesus is going to be resurrected, that Jesus is going to ascend back into heaven. He's preparing a place for us, and he will come again. Jesus, who, who comes as a baby in this Christmas season, that he is our living hope. He is the one that we can turn to. He is the one that we can place everything in full expectation because God has done what God said he was going to do, and God's going to finish the job that he said he was going to do as well. And so today you may be sitting here watching this and you may be feeling like, I, I just don't know how it's going to work out. I just don't know how it's going to play out. I, I don't get it and I don't feel like I'm hurt. Let me just challenge you with this, that I don't know what it is that you're walking through in this particular moment, but God is there. God can hear you. God can move. God can do incredible things. You just have to make the choice of saying, you know what? I'm going all in. I'm going to spend time with God in a way I haven't before. And here's why we need to do it. We need to do it as individuals because it will draw us closer to God. It will not make our lives perfect. But when we can hear God and when we can see what God's going to do and we hear the promises of God, then we can trust that he's going to come through and he's going to be faithful. But at the same time, as we move in that what manner, as our hope grows, as our tikva grows, as our expectation that God is who he says he is and God will do what God says he's going to do, as all of that grows, then all of a sudden we want to move outside of the, the walls of the church. We want to move outside of the walls of our house and we want to share our faith with other people because we know that if God did it for me, if God did it for the people of the New Testament, if God did it for the people of the Old Testament, then God can do it for others and God can do it today. We need our hope to grow. We need to hear what God is saying to us so that we can make a difference in our world. Here's what I want to do as we close. I want to do a salvation prayer because you might be listening to this and you may feel like, well, I've, I've never heard God's voice. And I believe the fact today that God wants to fill your life with hope. And if God wants to fill your life with hope, he can do it right now. And all it is is a matter of inviting Jesus into your heart. And as a simple prayer like this, I'm going to, I'm going to pray for you in a moment. But it's just a matter of saying, Jesus, would you come into my heart? Would you change my life? My life is a mess. My life is falling apart. I don't know what to do on my own, but I know I need you. I know that you, you sent Jesus in this Christmas season, that he, he came as a, as a child. He lived a perfect life. He was our sacrifice. He was our living hope. He was resurrected. He was sent back into heaven, and he's coming again. And I place my trust in you, God. I thank you for Jesus. And put it in your own word. It doesn't need to be fancy. It doesn't need to be perfect. But it's a matter of the heart of saying, Jesus, would you come in and would you move and would you do something special in my life? And then I believe that there's some of you that you just feel today that you desperately need hope. That we can enter this Christmas season, uh, this month of December, where we celebrate Jesus and, and his birth. And we can feel like, yeah, that's all good, but we're going to get to the end of Christmas season and I'm just, I'm, I don't know what to do. And let me encourage you, if that's you today, that God has a good dosage of hope for you. He wants to speak it. He wants you to hear it. And all you have to do today is say, Lord, speak for your servant is listening. And God will begin to speak and God will begin to pour in. You just have to make the choice of saying, I want to listen and I'm going to the source so that I can hear God's voice. So let me pray for both groupings this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray for my friends this morning that they're watching this and they're listening to this and maybe they have never accepted you into their life before. Lord, I know that you can do incredible things in their life. As we celebrate this Christmas season and Jesus coming, Lord, we know why Jesus came and it was to set us free to, to break the bondage of sin so that we could have a relationship with you again. Lord, I pray right now for those that are listening and they're accepting Christ right now for the first time, Lord, that you would begin to radically change and transform their life so that they would follow after you, and Lord, that their life would never, ever be the same again. And Lord, I pray for my friends that as they watch this right now, Lord, that their hope 
level is low. Lord, they don't know what to do. They feel like they're not hearing your voice. Lord, I pray right now that you would begin speaking to them both in, in prayer, maybe in dreams, maybe through scripture as they read uh, their, their Bibles. But Lord, you'd begin speaking to them. You would catch their attention. And Lord, that they would have the attitude that say, speak for your servant is listening. That they would desire to experience more of you today, God. So that their hope can grow, that they can hear your hope, that they can grow in that hope, and that they can go out and share that hope with others who need to hear it as well. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to just come into your presence and spend some time in your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I hope you will join us next week for this third message of Hope Abounds. I think it's going to be a great and powerful message, so I hope you'll join us. But before we go, I would just like us to do the Great Commission together. If you would repeat with me today. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you for joining us today. I look forward to being back with you next week, and I look forward to seeing you soon here in the building. Have a great and wonderful rest of your weekend. We've set up a simple way for you to give to our church online. If you want to give a quick gift, enter an amount, select a fund, then enter your email address and your first and last name. Then enter your payment details and click Give. And that's it! We'll send a receipt to your email address. To use a saved payment method or manage a recurring donation, you'll want to log in. Click the Login button and we'll send a code to your phone or email account. Verify the code, and you're in. Now your payment info is ready to go when you want to make a donation. To manage your giving details, switch over to the My Giving page. Here you'll see more ways you can give. You can also add a payment method, a bank account or a debit card, set up a recurring donation, and view your giving history.